Okay, good morning everybody and welcome to the 23rd meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2017. Um, could I ask those in the public gallery to switch off their electronic devices or at least switch them to silent mode? Um, could we agree to take item three in private? That's great. Thank you very much. Can I move us now on to item two, which is evidence from the Auditor General for Scotland's audit of the Scottish Government Consolidated Accounts for 2016-17. And I welcome to the committee this morning Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, Stephen Boyle, Assistant Director, and Michael Oliphant, Senior Audit Manager, all with Audit Scotland. And could I invite an opening statement from Caroline Gardner? Thank you, Convener. As you know, the Scotland Acts of 2012 and 2016 have introduced significant new responsibilities for tax and spending. The new financial powers bring fresh opportunities and also new financial risks that need to be managed. They come at a time of continuing pressures on the public finances and uncertainty about the implications of the UK vote to leave the European Union. These changes increase the need for the Scottish Government to provide comprehensive, clear and consistent financial reporting to enable Parliament and this committee to carry out its important scrutiny role. The consolidated accounts before you today are a critical component of this and of the Government's accountability to Parliament and the public. The accounts cover around 90% of the spending approved by Parliament in 2016-17, the elements that the Government is directly responsible for. They show the amount spent against each main budget heading and the reasons for any significant differences. They also show assets, liabilities and other financial commitments carried forward to future years. My report sets out how the consolidated accounts relate to the Scottish budget as a whole and highlights the main financial management issues for the government during the year. My opinion on the consolidated accounts is unqualified. I'm content that they provide a true and fair view of the government's finances. And I'd like to highlight four areas. First, financial management and reporting. The Scottish Government managed its budget for 2016-17 within the overall limits set by Parliament and the accounts meet the legal and accounting requirements. The Government has a good record of financial management and reporting and it's committed to enhancing financial transparency, including the introduction of a consolidated account covering the whole public sector. I welcome the steps the Government's taking to improve the presentation of the accounts. The recommendations of the Budget Process Review Group will also see further significant changes to financial reporting, including the introduction of a medium-term financial strategy. Longer-term planning is essential for effective decision-making, and the Government's reporting on the current financial position and future plans and forecasts should support financial sustainability, transparency and accountability. This will allow Parliament to take a broader perspective in its tax and spending decisions and hold the government to account for its overall management of public finances. Secondly, governance. In October last year, the Scottish Government put new governance arrangements in place to reflect the demands of constitutional change and new financial powers. The success of these arrangements will be determined by how they operate in practice, and in particular, the culture and behaviours of those involved will be central in ensuring, ensuring that scrutiny and challenge are effective. I will keep the revised arrangements under review as part of our continuing audit work. Thirdly, performance. The consolidated accounts do contain a performance report which complies with government reporting requirements. The emphasis is on financial performance against budget, with signposting to more detailed performance information, for example, in the National Performance Framework. There is further scope for the Scottish Government to develop its annual reporting to provide a more rounded picture of its overall performance. Finally, convener, I draw the committee's attention to two specific matters arising from the audit um, of last year's accounts. First, the continuing risk to the Common Agricultur Agricultural Policy Futures Programme and how this is reflected in the accounts. And secondly, the closing position on the 2007-13 European Structural Funds Programmes, leading to the repayment of £31 million in grants received by the Scottish Government to the European Commission. The Committee's evidence session on the Scottish Government's consolidated accounts is a central part of parliamentary scrutiny of the Government's finances. My report on the 2016-17 audit is designed to support this, as well as scrutiny and accountability more generally. As always, Convener, we're happy to answer the Committee's questions. Thank you very much, Auditor General. Um, can I turn to questions from members and start with Colin Beattie? Thank you, Auditor General, overall this report's a pretty good report, actually. Why is it a Section 22 report? 
Um, it's a, a very good question. As the committee knows, Section 22 reports um, have traditionally been reserved for cases where there's a problem in, a, in an audited body, um, but that's not the uh, statutory basis for them. The statutory basis that I, is that I can use them to bring anything that I think appropriate arising from the audit of the accounts to the committee's attention. The history of this Section 22 report goes back, I think, three years um, to the introduction of the new financial powers under the 2012 Scotland Act um, and the committee's request at that point that I consider um, bringing an annual report to them alongside the, cons the Consolidated Accounts Audit, reflecting the fact they do cover £34 billion of public spending um, and that the level of risk and, and volatility that's involved is increasing rapidly as the 2012 and now the 2016 Acts um, are being implemented. So presumably in years to come you'll still continue to have it as a Section 22? As Auditor General at the moment, I think it's an important part of the accountability for that £34 billion. Um, as the committee knows, the um, audited accounts of all public bodies are laid in Parliament and would be available for this committee to scrutinise, but I hope it's useful to have a report from me which pulls out what I see as being the key features from this year and then a look ahead to what's coming in future. Okay. Um, just turning to capital borrowing, and I'm looking at uh, the uh, NPD projects. Now, obviously, NPD was brought in as a, an alternative to the uh, PFI or PPP, whatever you want to call them, um, on the basis that uh, they'd be cheaper to run and better controls. But... Uh, I thought they, they were being structured in such a way that they did not come on the books as uh, public projects, public sector projects. Um, I'll ask the team to come in in a moment. Members of the committee may recall that this came up as an issue for the first time on last year's consolidated accounts in 2015-16. Um, the background was that the rules covering the national accounts, that's not the financial reporting, but the national statistics, had changed from Europe. The European statistics requirements were different. Um, that meant that the Office for National Statistics classified the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route um, as uh, a project that needed to be on the government's balance sheet. And the Scottish Government, on the back of that decision, um, took the decision that three other projects, which were structured in a very similar way, should also be brought onto the balance sheet and therefore needed borrowing cover. I think what um, you're recalling is that at the same time they reviewed other projects which were still in the pipeline and um, aimed to structure them as far as possible in a way that would keep them off the balance sheet. And obviously in there there's a trade-off between um, direction and control which the government has, which is one of the factors that drives their classification as public sector or not, and the extent to which bodies are accountable back to government for the funds that they're spending. So there's a judgment involved in that. So it's not across the board? as far yeah. as NPD projects are concerned? Uh, the, the initial decision re reflected those four projects which were structured in a very similar way and our understanding is that the government has reviewed the structuring of other projects in the pipeline in a way that it feels keeps them off the balance sheet. We're, com we're confident that the accounting treatment in 16-17 is correct and it's something we'll keep under review. So you agree that with the government that uh, these other projects should be off the balance sheet? Um, that's a decision not for us, but for the Office for National Statistics. Um, we think it's a good thing that they've reviewed them, and we will keep in view um, the application of the ONS uh, guidelines and the accounting treatment that flows from that. Stephen, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think Auditor General has covered the, the, the key point about the, the driver behind the decision to bring them onto the, the government's balance sheet was the, the ONS decision, um, rather than any specific decision that the government itself uh, initiated. Oh, uh I mean, have any of the other projects been reviewed by ONS? In other words, do we have something, that's, uh, some process that's been tested already or some structure that's been tested already and found to be OK? I think it's true to say the projects themselves haven't been reviewed, but what we have is what is available generally is a work programme from the Office for National Statistics of the areas that it intends to review. And the government looks at that in um, making its own decisions, as well as the broader guidelines on what the ESA requirements are. We're not expecting any further change, but it is always a possibility. I mean, clearly that reclassification put the capital budget under some pressure. It did. In order to meet the requirements in terms of accounting, the Scottish Government agreed with Her Majesty's Treasury that it could use the borrowing powers in place for 15-16 and 16-17 to cover the headroom that was required, um, and that uh, did squeeze out other capital spending.
but from this year on, that should be relaxed a bit because of the new powers. Uh, that there are still limits on uh, borrowing. They're increasing every year. I think Michael's probably in a good position to yeah. talk you through what the current position is. I think in relation to the, the capital spending that's still to come for these four projects, um, we found that there's £190 million included within the 2017-18 budget um, that is required for this ONS classification. That's obviously less than it was required during 16-17, so I think um, it's probably that there they're through the woods, if, if you like, for these four projects in terms of the, the capital budgeting or initial capital budgeting spend that's required. Okay, just a couple of quick questions. On paragraph uh, 25, you've, you're talking about uh, the block grant and the forecast tax income from Scottish taxpayers, and it says no adjustments will be made to future Scottish budget should the actual tax received in 2016 17 differ from this forecast. I thought there was a I thought there was a review process on that to assess whether the forecasts were correct before it got set in stone. This is the transitional year. So for 16-17, um, the block grant adjustment stands and there won't be an adjustment to it later for the reconciliation. From 17-18 onwards, there will be, and you're quite right. That's obviously one of the elements that is increasing, increasing the risk and the volatility in the Scottish budget in future. Um, the receipts may be higher than forecast, in which case the budget's better off, or lower, in which case it's worse off. But that's 17-18 onwards, not 16-17. And the last question I was going to ask was in connection with uh, really the, the budgeting cycle. And, uh, you know, yourself, you, you're always encouraging people to have a longer uh, forecast, uh, three, four year budget. Uh, it's very, is it not very difficult for the Scottish Government to do that when it doesn't actually know how big the check it's going to get is? Um, I think in some ways it's becoming more possible and also more important to do it as the new financial powers come in. Um, I mentioned in my opening statement the report of the Budget Process Review Group, and one of the recommendations in there was the introduction of a medium-term financial strategy that looks ahead five years at um, what's likely to happen to the economy and therefore what's likely to happen to the devolved tax revenues, um, an indication of the block grant, which will still be around 50% of what we spend based on UK government projections um, and forecasts from the Office for Budget Responsibility, for example, and broad trends in spending based on things like demographics and, and policy as it stands now. It will obviously be a high-level strategy and there will be both policy changes and environmental changes that, that affect it, um, but the Budget Process Review Group felt that was a very important uh, starting point for, for budgeting and for parliamentary scrutiny, and I think the recommendation has been accepted by both the Finance Committee of this Parliament and by the Cabinet Secretary for Finance. I can understand uh, those elements of the tax that are within our powers here, doing forecasts and so on for that, but the block grant is, is subject to not just uh, economic pressures, there's other budget pressures and so on within the Westminster Government that come to bear on that. And, you know, we've had cuts virtually every year, and as far as we know, we don't know what's going to happen in November. The, these, to some extent, will continue. It makes it quite difficult for the block grant to be projected. I think it, it certainly is impossible to, to know what the firm figures will be, um, but the block grant will be still 50% of the resources available to the government um, and therefore uh, projecting ahead what might happen to it and having a range of possibilities, scenarios for um, upside and downside risk gives a, a sense of how much overall resource the government has to plan with and therefore the choices that it's making in each individual year's budget. I wonder whether I could pursue a couple of points on capital borrowing with you um, as a result of the reclassification of projects. Um, the amount I think it was Michael Oliphant raised with us was 190 million is projected for 1718 for four projects. Is there any requirement for capital for those projects beyond 1718? I, I don't know the detail of that. We'd need to see in, obviously, subsequent budgets, um, the, the forthcoming budget, say, for 18-19, to know if there's, if there's any more in relation to that. I was referring specifically to the budget as we know it for 17-18. They don't profile ahead. They don't look at their liabilities ahead. We would expect the Scottish Government to be doing that, but in terms of what is publicly available through the budget. Okay. That's helpful to know. Um, given that, that so much capital was used... 
for the reclassification of these particular projects. Um, does that mean that there was an opportunity lost and other projects were reprofiled as a consequence? Um, we explored the, this in some detail with the committee last year, um, and I recognise that many members of the committee are new since then. Um, what, um, what we... Uh, what we conveyed to the committee, and I think what was confirmed by the Scottish Government, was that it was possible to manage that with reprofiling the projects that were coming through, and in particular the projects that were reviewed in line with Mr Beattie's question to see whether they um, needed to be structured differently or needed to come onto the balance sheet. Some of those were delayed, so that meant that the, the spending profile went further out. Okay, that's helpful to know. Um, and my final question with this is um, just clarification in paragraph 29. You talk about capital pressures arising from NPD um, as a result of the ONS classification would have to be absorbed within capital DEL limits with capital borrowing powers to be used as intended. Um, does that mean that there is no access to the new capital borrowing powers or can they spend up to the limit of, of the new powers? The intention is that the capital borrowing powers are available to be used as intended um, from the 1718 budget onwards. Capital Dell was used to cover the implications of the NPD projects that were reclassified. Okay. That's helpful to know. And, and one final thing before I move on to Bill Bowman. Um, it is the case that we now have new borrowing powers in the event of economic shocks. They weren't triggered last year. But my understanding is the eligibility criteria for using that power has now been triggered. Is that something that has been indicated anywhere publicly by the Scottish Government? Um, it's, it's not indicated in the accounts that are before you today and that there is no expectation or requirement that it should be. Um, again, referring back to the uh, report of the Budget Process Review Group, one mm. of the recommendations in there was that there should first of all be an annual fiscal framework outturn report that demonstrates how all of the elements of the fiscal framework um, have been used in the year. Um, and secondly, a recommendation for mid-year reporting around budget revisions that would pick up exactly that sort of point. Okay. Thank you very much. Bill Bowman. Convener, good morning. I've looked through your report more to the actual accounts themselves, which I presume you maybe have with you. Yeah. And I've got a, well, I have a number of questions, which some of which I maybe need a little bit more information on, but I'll just focus on a couple of points here just now. There's one on page 33, which says, and this is to do with the remuneration of ministers. And it says, the First Minister has a benefit in kind for 2016-17 of £334, arising from the provision of accommodation at Butte House and the comparatives for the previous year is £93.81. Do you know how that is calculated? Um, I'll maybe ask Michael to come in. I'm afraid of the detail in, in front of me um, at the moment that we can come back to the committee on that. But that would be an audited number? It would be, yes. You don't? remember anything about it just it, seems a strange number it, it is a low number it's worth me being clear that um Stephen and michael lead the audit team but as you'd expect for an audit of 34 billion pounds there's a much wider team behind us and we're happy to revert to the committee after this meeting with more detail on any of the questions that we need to okay the next question relates to page 62 which is the um consolidated statement of financial position or the balance sheet as I would have called it, and perhaps follows on a little bit from um, the convener's questions about liabilities. If I understand it correctly, the total current assets are 2.4 billion, yeah. and total current liabilities are 3. Point, well, 3.4 billion. Yes. Now, it says in the accounts that they're prepared on a going concern basis, and you might think that's an obvious thing for, for a government. But if you're lacking a billion pounds in current assets to meet your current liabilities. Is there something in the accounts that explains how that is going to be dealt with? The first thing to say, I think, is that you're absolutely right. The, um, the tests that we need to apply to government and public sector bodies are different um, from those that would, would apply to many private sector bodies for obvious reasons. Stephen, I'll ask you to talk through the audit approach there. Thanks, Auditor General. Um, it's, it's something that we see quite commonly in, in public sector bodies that um, liabilities can outstrip assets and as often as part of our audit approach is something we consider carefully about the, the flow of funds coming into the organisation in future years as to how that secures their long-term future. I think particularly as the Auditor General mentions that the nature of public sector bodies 
and the assumptions that we're able to make about the flow of funds um, gives us that certainty to allow us to consider in the round uh, going concern implications. We follow that through um, as part of our approach under auditing standards to ensure that it's considered fully by, by audit committees and through the representations that we seek from the Principal Accountable Officer that the um, that senior officials are cited on the implications around that and we've considered it fully through to prior to the, the signing of the, the Auditor General's opinion on the accounts. So they do forecasts of their cash flow? Yes, indeed. And there's no doubt then that this will be settled? Or they will have the funds to settle the amounts? The, the certainly are, there are forecasts about, and the, the ratio of, of assets and liabilities um, that's presented in this year's accounts is not an unusual position. And the government continues to, you know, through its position um, and the, the receipt of funds through the block grant and now through the additional revenue from, from tax raising powers, having considered that position and, and what we've seen in, in, in past uh, ability to, to settle debts as and when they've arisen, we're content that that's a, a reasonable position to adopt. Do you think they should say anything as to why this is not an issue? As I say, the, the only reference I could find to going concern was a statement in the um, the responsibility is that the accounts have to be prepared as an ongoing concern basis, and that seems to be just the end of it. It's a good question. I guess reflects the value of having um, somebody with your professional background um, grounded in a private sector setting. Um, I think the starting assumption that um, we apply, as Stephen has said, um, is that the government is able to draw down through this Scottish Consolidated Fund all of the block grant which is set at the beginning of the year from the UK government, which has um, very significant tax and borrowing powers to meet its commitments. And from 2016-17, the Scottish government itself now has tax raising powers that it could use if it found itself in a position um, where it was uh, finding it difficult to meet its liabilities. Um, it's probably worth saying as well that's another one of the reasons why the medium-term financial strategy feels so important, so that you're not looking at this one year at a time as the accounts do, but looking out over a five-year period. You mention or recommend that there's a, a further consolidation done, I think. Do you think that would show a different position? It certainly would, and that's one of the reasons why I've been recommending it for the last few years. Um, the balance sheet, obviously, is a key part of any set of financial statements, and like you, that's the terminology I grew up with. Um, what the balance sheet that we have in front of us here doesn't include um, is some very significant liabilities, like uh, wider pension liabilities across the public sector and borrowing from other public bodies, in particular local government, which is fairly significant um, in total. Um, Neither of those are liabilities which would fall immediately to the Scottish Government in the event of problems, um, but in practice the Scottish Government would certainly have a responsibility to step in and ensure the liabilities were met. Um, and there are obviously also very significant assets um, in other parts of the public sector which aren't shown here. We do have whole of government accounts for the UK as a whole to which Scotland contributes. We don't have that equivalent balance sheet consolidated for Scotland as a whole. Is that just a recommendation from you, or do you have some response that they will do that? Um, I first recommended it in 2013. The government has, sin has since made a commitment to introducing them, um, and we are now in a, a dry run period where they are um, going through the, the preparatory um, work to strip out the double counting, the related party transactions and so on that would be involved. I can't require it, but the government has made a commitment to doing it. We might follow that up. Indeed. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Liam. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I, I'll, I'll just start on the, the overall budget. Uh, you, the accounts show the total net expenditure was 33,870 million, which was 85 million less than budgeted. Uh, and you have a table that shows various areas which have been Underfunded is the wrong word, but you know what I mean. They, they, they haven't received quite as much as they were budgeted for, so such as education, social security and justice. And I think people would be surprised at this. So what happens to the 85 million that hasn't been spent? Uh, and I think people will be looking at this and saying, well, education, for example, uh, doesn't have a great deal of cash swilling around in it, so why isn't that money being spent in it? <laughs> 
Um, I'll start off and then ask Stephen to come in on the specifics of the underspends that are shown in the account. Um, first of all, um, it's worth noting that the 85 million, although it's a very large number, is only 0.025% of the overall 34 billion or so that's spent by the Scottish Government last year. Um, and secondly, um, the uh, <coughs> Dell underspend, to use the, the jargon, which is what this is, can now go into the Scotland Reserve and be carried forward for um, use in future on similar types of spending. So it's not lost to Scotland, it's carried forward. You're right, though, there's an opportunity cost in the year of money which isn't spent on the purposes for which it was intended. Stephen. Thank you, Auditor General. Um, specifically, in, in terms of the, the government's accounts provide a description of, um, through, the, through the narrative uh, part of the accounts, as to why budgets have been over or underspent. And they draw attention to a couple of areas that you mentioned, Mr Kerr, in terms of uh, education. In particular, they highlight um, underspends as a result of uh, timing for um, initiating the, uh, the attainment fund and the availability of that budget next year. And, and they explain that as and when projects were identified and initiated during the, the, the middle of the year, that the availability of projects and uh, to deliver that fund hadn't come through in sufficient time. Nonetheless, that budget is identified to be ca carried forward into 17-18 for, for use next year. Can I, I'd like to just press you on that because on page 8 of your report, uh, we talk about the health and sport. Uh, there was an overspend of £112 million. Uh, Now, of course, no one would ever want to go over budget, but I think by and large people would be sympathetic where it's health. Uh, except that uh, this apparently mainly related to an increase of 160 million to the provision used to assess legal claims against health sports. Would you be able just to explain that? Because 160 million to assess legal claims, is that right? Not quite. The, the increases in the provision in the accounts for possible future costs, which may crystallise in future years. I'm not sure whether Stephen or Michael is best placed to talk you through more detail. Yeah. The cost of the litigation if the, ultimately yes. successful by the claimant? Absolutely. The, effectively, the cost of the damages more than the, the legal, the cost of assessing the cost, if that makes sense. Yes, it's, Michael. It's really the, the, the adjustment we've seen this year is a, 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 it's a technical change in how that model effectively is calculated, which brings a, an additional provision of £160 million. I think it's important to note that it doesn't affect the spending power of the health budget. This is categorised as annually managed expenditure, which Treasury provide annual budget cover for. So it doesn't affect the spending power that was included with the health budget. And we understand that what was there by way of spending power for health was, was used up within 1617. And just so I'm clear then, so effectively the Scottish NHS makes provision for 160 million to settle or to, to pay off successful or settled claims against it and if so do you get any sense of there's obviously a, a, a bill being proposed at the moment which, which has as its end game increasing access to justice which logically means more claims potentially against the NHS do you get any sense that the Scottish Government having provisioned 160 million now is provisioning even more on the basis of that act coming or that bill becoming an act I wouldn't know whether that is, is factored into the figures. What I do know is that the, the approach the Scottish Government has taken is similar to a UK approach. This is the, using the same model that applies across the, across the UK. Um, so a specific Scottish judgment, I wouldn't necessarily know if that's included or, or not. Not. I think most of the accounting adjustments that are made reflect um, the legislation which already applies to the health service and other services. Um, but it is one of the things that potentially could come into play into me in a medium-term financial strategy. If a change of that nature was likely to have significant impacts on costs in an area, then it's something which um, should well be played into that, thinking about what's going to happen to spending on health over the longer term. I understand. Thank you. Stephen, you look like you're going to say something. Thanks, Mr. The only thing I, I would add about, um, in terms of the, the legal claims, has been a, it's been a feature of health board accounting for, for many years in respect of clinical and med medical negligence claims, and typically they've they've assessed them in terms really their their likelihood and proximity to, to payment on a, on a on a scale of three to one, 
and three has driven um, a provision, uh, and then down to, to a grade of one has led to what they've categorised as, as a contingent liability in accounting terms, and it really reflects the most likelihood of, of settlement. So the increase in the provision is essentially that, just as part of what we think is appropriate, an ongoing review of the most the likelihood of payment, and, and that's been captured uh, appropriately in the accounts. Thank you. I'd like to just look at the LBTT uh, as well. Which, so in this report, uh, you talk about the amount being raised from land and buildings transaction tax and Scottish landfill was 633 million, 38 million less than the, the forecast. Uh, now, specifically on LBTT, I would say, uh, purely anecdotally, uh, living in Aberdeen, that the LBTT uh, has killed the market, if I can put it that way. It, 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 the reason for the, the reduction in receipts, projected receipts, is because the market has reacted negatively to the introduction of LBTT. The Scottish Government presumably would disagree with me. What does their analysis say is the reason for the depressed receipt, projected receipts? Um, the Scottish Fiscal Commission published a report last month, um, which is called the Forecast Evaluation Report, um, and it's a thing they'll produce annually in future years. What that does is to go back to the forecasts which um, fed into each Scottish Government budget and then compare it with the outturn when that's available um, and do their best to explore the differences based on the way the model worked, the inputs to the model and what happened in practice. Um, they had a session with the Finance Committee a couple of weeks ago and as you would expect the land and building transactions tax difference was um, a significant element of that session. Um, I think there were two things which they stressed in, in their report. Um, the first was that the forecasts that fed into the 16-17 budget were those made in December 2015 for the first time, um, with a new tax for Scotland and a new structure from its predecessor tax, the old stamp duty, um, and therefore th there was always likely to be greater forecast error in there. Um, there were changes to the tax with the later introduction of the additional dwelling supplement just prior to the start of the financial year, which also um, came into the mix at a late position. And in terms of the quality of the forecast itself, I think they identified that the biggest variation was um, around the uh, the movement in house prices across Scotland. Um, and they concluded that actually the movement in uh, the North East was not a major contributor to that. The broader picture seemed to be that the forecast had assumed that house price growth would return to trend after the financial crisis in 2008. Um, and in fact, that, is, as with many other parts of the economy, is still below trend and that that was the biggest contributor. Um, but it clearly is very important that um, the government and parliament do have a very clear picture of how forecasts relate to outturns and how forecasts are improving over time as both our, our collective experience gets better and the data improves for the particular taxes we're looking at. Sure. Uh, one final question for me then. Uh, just staying on LBTT, at page five of the report, you just say the Scottish Government managed this shortfall, being the LBTT shortfall, through underspends in its overall budget. Do you have any sense of which other budgets suffered, I, I don't use that pejoratively, but didn't get quite as much as a result of that under projection? Um, I think the table on page 7 and 8 gives you the major areas taken from the Scottish Government's accounts where the, there were those movements. Um, as always, there are some areas where spend will be lower than expected anyway, some areas where um, the amount that's spent depends on demand um, from external parties for the funding that's available, and they were able to manage it uh, within the overall budget to the 85 million that you identified in your first question. Um, I, I don't think we have any evidence that there were areas that went short in that sense, but as I said in my answer to the convener earlier, money that's not spent on the purpose for which it was originally intended obviously does have an opportunity cost. Thank you. Okay. Willie Coffey. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah. Now, just on that point there, Auditor General, on page 12, you do indicate that there was a <coughs> higher than forecast receipt from LBTT and, S and uh, SFLT of £74 million a year before, which is still held in reserve, as I understand it and that any of the shortfalls in the particular year mentioned there were met through various underspends elsewhere. So 
the, the point you made about, it was also made at the Finance Committee about the ebb and flow of forecasting being a bit of a black art, uh, I think was, was, was well made. Um, but I wanted to ask you about the broader question about scrutiny, and you mentioned the, again the, the Finance Committee. Uh, as you well know, the Parliament in, in the Finance Committee last year had some difficulty with the scrutiny process, due mainly, I think, to the timing of the budget and the compressed timescale for scrutiny that we had within the Scottish Parliament. And, and also during the course of the year, it wasn't clear to some members of that committee how some unplanned expenditure was actually achieved and the impact that that might have on the wider budget. And of course, that led the committee to request the revised framework for scrutiny, which would give all members of the, the, the committee and indeed the Parliament the chance to see the ebb and flow of the, of the cash throughout the course of the year to give everyone a better chance and a, a clearer insight into that. Could you say a wee bit more about how that is planned to roll out and how that will work and how it might aid not only the Finance Committee but other members of the Parliament? Absolutely. Um, and perhaps before I do, I could just note uh, you referenced particularly the, the um, ebb and flow in the land and building transaction tax from 1516 into 1718. And of course, that's a tax which has inbuilt more volatility than most because the um, non domestic element of it, non residential element of it, um, tends to depend on a very small number of very high value transactions. So that there tends to be more shifting. In terms of in-year scrutiny of the budget, which I think was, was your, the main part of your question, um, it's something that the Budget Process Review Group, of which I was a member, considered very carefully. Um, we know there will be more volatility and that will move in different directions for different um, devolved taxes and for different expenditure lines. Um, equally, the process as a whole is probably the most important thing, the big picture, rather than what's happening line by line, month by month on individual taxes. So the recommendation that the group made was that there should be reporting back to Parliament, formal reporting back to Parliament mid-year um, at the time that the, uh, the autumn budget revision, I think, comes back to Parliament um, that sets out the overall picture um, in terms of where revenues are higher or lower than expected, where expenditure is higher or lower than expected, and the main reasons the action the government is taking to manage that, including the use of its revenue borrowing powers and the use of the reserve, which is referred to here, and then how that will play through into any budget revisions which are being requested for Parliament to approve. Um, on balance, we thought that doing that once during the year in the run-up to the budget process was more likely to be useful than having quarterly or monthly um, reporting at this point. Although we were very conscious that in New Zealand, for example, the New Zealand Treasury simply publishes monthly management accounts um, showing the picture at each point in time. That's something that Scotland may want to develop towards, but we felt at this stage that would risk crowding out the big picture and the decisions that need to be taken in that context. Mm. Now, let's see on the issue about the, the unplanned expenditure and the miraculous appearance of some money to, to fund a particular initiative or other. How, how, how better and clearer do you think that, that will be with this new process so that members can see where movements of money are going from department to department, for example. How clear will that be for everyone, do you think? Our recommendations from the Budget Process Review Group were absolutely intended to do that, and I think there were two key things. One was the need to have um, the big picture easily seen in one place um, that pulls together not just these accounts, um, but also things like the non-domestic rate account and the Scottish Consolidated Fund account, which sit next to this but aren't drawn together, that also shows the Scotland Reserve and the use of borrowing powers, um, and that shows the movements in each of those headings across the year compared to the budget. That would help. At the moment, you have to work quite hard um, to pull that picture together, even if you're accountants with access to all the numbers. Um, and people in Parliament, people across Scotland, would find that much more difficult than we do. We think it should be there straightforwardly for you to use. The second one um, that the uh, group uh, recommended and, and I think feels quite strongly about is efforts to separate out the um, numerical presentation of the budget from the um, political presentation of the narrative that goes alongside that. And just to pluck one example, I know there was a, a fair bit of confusion in the Finance Committee and the Local Government Committee last year about the Local Government Settlement, because the figure that was in the budget um, was confused in some people's minds with um, figures around the overall funding available to local government that took in things like um, the amount available from council tax increases and from the £250 million that went to IGBs from the health service. So 
So we think that separating out the, the presentation of the numbers in a technical sense from the political presentation which any government will want to do will also help that clarity. Finally, for, for us, I mean, the Finance Committee will do that regularly, I think, throughout the course of the year. For us as an audit committee, is there scope for us to, to look at these kinds of figures on perhaps a quarterly basis, or should we continue, do you think, to, to wait till the consolidated annual account comes out before we get our chance at it? Um, it's obviously a decision for the committee. Um, my view, as you might um, expect, is that there is a particular value in audited numbers like these, um, which have been through the process of audit with all of the relevant um, auditing standards um, and accounting standards tested out. Um, and that using that perhaps to co compare back to the budget and understand what's changed and what the reasons for that are would be a very strong way of closing the loop. At the moment, a lot of the attention since Parliament was established has gone on to the budget for obvious reasons. This committee has the chance to, to compare the two, to understand the differences and to make recommendations looking ahead that can improve things for the future. OK. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Monica Lennon. Thanks, Convener. Good morning. I just want to return to the issue of underspend, which Liam Kerr mentioned. Um, but apologies, unlike Bill Bowman, I don't have a copy of the consolidated accounts in front of me. But I did want to pick up on the, the underspend in relation to the, the community's budget. And I suppose it, it relates to, to housing and infrastructure, infrastructure spending. Um, I think from the report, I can see that there's £62 million pounds of underspend, and that mostly relates to the housing budget and the infrastructure loan fund. Um, I just wonder if I can try and unpick that with you and how that differs from last year. You're right, there is, un there is an underspend of um, £62 million, and the government itself um, in the accounts looks to explain movements from uh, actual t uh, to budget but, uh, to give some context uh, to that analysis. Um, apologies, we don't have a lot of the detail that, that underpins um, that movement, but in terms of the explanation, um, the, it really goes on to say that the, the Infrastructure Loans Fund was established um, during 16-17, uh, and the reason that the, the spend wasn't as anticipated related to the availability um, of sites uh, for new provision become av available from both uh, councillors and private sector providers. And, and inevitably, that there's a, there is a lead-in time to sites becoming available and then money being spent. So that wasn't all in place uh, during the course of the 16-17 the year to allow that spend uh, to go through as, as had been anticipated in the original budget. Yeah. So if I could just add to that, it's, 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 it's always a challenge, particularly when, when new funds are created to be, to be set up to identify what the profile of spending will be over, particularly if it's set up over a number of years. Uh, in relation to the Infrastructure Loan Fund, um, it's a loan to, to non-public sector organisations prioritised for housing, so it's also for other infrastructure, but it's prioritised for housing. Um, as Stephen mentioned, there are timing challenges um, around sort of the getting sites available um, so that the money could be could be spent within 1617, but where the underspend happened in relation to the loans fund, it was par partially offset by higher demand in the help to buy scheme. So that just gives you an indication of where demand um, activity really kind of drives whether there's overspends or underspends in certain areas. Okay, thank you, Stephen and Michael. That's that's helpful. I appreciate you're saying that the scheme is, is fairly new, but there was a house building and infrastructure loan fund launched back in 2011 I believe so can you explain what the difference is between the schemes I, I do know there's a number of, of schemes within the infrastructure loans fund um, I don't know the details perhaps a, a, a detail that's better explained by the Scottish Government um, but specifically, specifically relating to the loans fund in 1617 that's what, what we looked at by way of the treatment through the consolidated accounts Okay. No, thank you. The reason why I was asking is just I appreciate this is a, a new scheme. I don't know how much it differs from the previous schemes in terms of the, the criteria and so on. But I think given we've had some kind of model since 2011, it'd be good to see what's been happening um, in the last number of years. Um, 
So I'll just to, you asked about how this compares in terms of the underspent of previous years. Um, I've just checked back to last year's report, um, and last year the underspend was 163 million in the same portfolio. Um, and again, we said at that point that it was mainly due to reduced revenue and capital spending on demand-led housing projects. So a significant underspend again, but larger last year than in 2016-17. Um, and as Michael said, if you're interested in the detail of the schemes, the Scottish Government, I think, would be well placed to talk you through that. Thank you. I think I won't follow that up, but that's at least a, a bit of an improvement. Um, in terms of, again, trying to understand what's going on, the word you used, I think, was availability of, of sites or availability of land. Um, are you able to say a bit more about what's um, understood by availability? Um, probably not, unfortunately. I think um, our, our, the purpose of our work in this, in, in this area is really to assess the, the performance against budget, but also the actual spend that has gone through um, in the year relative to what's been presented uh, for audit. And we're content that the, the number uh, is presented uh, is a reasonable uh, and, and accurate figure. Um, I think as we'd be happy to come back to the committee with, with more detail um, and equally, I'm, I'm sure the, the government themselves would be able to set out the, the nature and pattern of, of availability of sites and how that's translated into spend. Okay. Um, Again, I'm just, I don't know if you're able to answer this today, but maybe it's just useful to get it on the record. Um, we've talked previously in other sessions, Auditor General, about um, city deals, um, which clearly have a big role to play in terms of um, providing infrastructure and, and getting um, development on the ground. Is there, and again, I think the accountability around that is, is, is quite interesting, we could say. When we see an underspend um, in a, a loan fund like this, and we know there's other, um, you know, the government has a has an aim of, of making sure that we, we do try and deal that, so, solve the housing crisis and, and get development in the right place, is there any flexibility to move money around or, you know, to be working with the other partners like local government? In broad terms, um, the government does have flexibility to move money between budget headings, um, and you heard in earlier exchanges how they were able to do that to reflect the lower than expected receipts for the land and buildings transaction tax. But some parts of the budget are ring-fenced ring for, for good reasons. Um, you've, one of the tables we've looked at already shows things like um, non-cash Dell and the AMI funding, which is there for very specific purposes and can't be used for other purposes. Equally, some of the funding coming into city deals is match funding coming from the UK Treasury to match either Scottish Government funding or local authority funding, and that couldn't be used in other ways. Um, it might be helpful to note that we're carrying out, or I'm carrying out a piece of work jointly with the Accounts Commission looking at city deals more generally because of um, the complexities of the accountabilities involved. Um, that will be coming through, I hope, next year, um, and it, the aim of that is to drill down in a way that goes further than just the accounting treatment of the numbers to explain what's planned and what's being achieved with those significant amounts of funding. Anything either of you want to add to that? No. Okay. Just ask briefly about Help to Buy, because I, I can't see it on, on the page here, but um, from memory, I, I think there's also been an underspend on the Help to Buy budget. Is, is that correct? Um, I don't think the, the account should to that, to that detail. Okay. Um, I think that was just from my background information as to where the um, movements in budget would apply. So if the Scottish Government have identified a potential underspend as it's moving towards the, the year end in one area, what they've done is used some of that money to um, meet the higher demand through help to buy. Okay. I think what, what you're um, remembering is the uh, evidence that the committee took around the cap future scheme and the loans that were made, able, made available to farmers. Um, as payments were delayed. Some of the funding for those uh, loans came from the Financial Transactions uh, Fund, um, which covers help to buy, among other things. Um, but as Michael says, it's not shown to this to that level, I think, within our report and, and perhaps not within the accounts. Yeah. The only other context by way of the Financial Transactions Budget, Exhibit 3 to the report on page 10, sets out the, the overall uh, outturn against the, the HM Treasury Budget for uh, the Financial Transactions Budget for the year. Okay, thank you. And I think overall it's a good report. I know last year I asked a few um, questions around um, just the way information was set out and performance, and I think some of those points have been taken on board, and, and that's that's positive. Um, I suppose the only final one, I, I was looking again, um, I know that Liam Kerr had raised underspend, um, 
looking at education, but the baby box um, spending, um, I've had quite an interest in the baby box scheme and um, there's a lot of positive work going on there. And I know that the government's going to keep it under constant evaluation and that probably means that items will be added to, to the, the scheme as it goes forward. Can you just maybe explain what's meant here by the, the reprofiling of the baby box spending? So there was um, six million um, reprofiled to seventeen eighteen. So that effectively is six million pounds they didn't spend in the sixteen seventeen financial year that will be added to the budget in seventeen eighteen. Um, really, sixteen seventeen, as we understand it, focused more on the design and procurement of the scheme, um, and some of the the spending that was earmarked for sixteen seventeen was around the, the planned purchase of stock, but was no longer required because of the, the stage it was at. All that will feed into and be added to the budget for seventeen eighteen. And does that sit within the education budget, or is that the health budget? That's within education. Right. Was it always an education budget? Um, I don't know if it's if it's moved um, from one budget to another. As far as I'm aware, it was in education. Okay. It's 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 worth saying that with the there was a change in portfolio structures. Um, at the start of 2016-17, so some quite a number of budget headings would have moved from one portfolio to another just to match uh, ministerial changes in portfolios. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Okay, um, let me follow up with one question on underspend, if I may. Um, it, last year, I think, was the first time that the government anticipated underspend um, and actually spent it and allocated it within the budget before we had the outturn. Um, is that good accounting practice? Longer term financial planning is definitely good accounting practice. Um, and um, we've had a, a, a gradually evolving set of arrangements which allow government to do that, um, starting off with the budget exchange mechanism between the UK government and the Scottish government, now moving into the Scotland Reserve, which is, is formally there to smooth taking one year with another. Um, what I would expect to see is that being done as far as possible in a planned way and a transparent way, which is clear that um, funding is, for example, being held back from this year in order to make investments in future or, alternatively, that investments being made here to make savings in the longer term. Again, another reason for having a medium-term financial strategy. Um, the other point that, again, is worth making is that on a budget of £34 billion, um, what look like very large numbers are actually very small percentages, um, and therefore that smoothing is, is happening on a relatively limited um, level. And it's important that Parliament and its committees absolutely understand those movements to, put, to, be, to make sure they do get the big picture and the longer-term consequences of what they're seeing. OK, I, I recall a previous um, Cabinet Secretary for Finance actually allocating a budget that was, say, £100 million over... Um, what, what was allowed for in order to reduce underspends. That practice seems to have stopped. Would you encourage that as good practice in the future? Um, I think... I don't recall the specifics that you're um, referring to, so I'll be careful. Um, I think it, it is never good practice to have a budget which doesn't reflect what you expect to achieve during the year and indeed to be explicitly linked to the outcomes you want to get from it. Um, but in a budgeting context where there is little room for manoeuvre, um, that is the sort of thing that you, you see. One of the reasons why I've been recommending longer-term financial planning in the health service since I've been in this job is that a focus on hitting a very specific um, revenue resource limit tends to um, drive bad behaviour about getting spending out the door at the end of March rather than planning for the longer term. The, the whole budgeting context needs to support good financial management. Thank you. Alex Neal. Uh, first of all, can I just follow up on Liam Kerr's question about the legal provision in the health service? The 160 million is that over a, that provision? Is that over a specified number of years? <coughs> I can certainly come back to the committee with, with the detail of what our understanding of, of work in this area that um, legal, legal claims from receipt through to any final decision can take many, many years uh, of. Uh, from what I remember is my, in my time as the health secretary, the actual payouts were about sixty or seventy million pounds per year. Mm. So I'm uh, just wondering how long the provision lasts for. I think, um, as you say, Mr. Neil, it can it can vary. 
and the provision will last for as long as it's deemed to be necessary uh, to be in place until there is um, either certainty that the claim will or won't need to be settled and any corresponding uh, amount. Based on actual payouts, if you could t come back to us and tell us how long you would estimate that that provision would last for, because um, if it was provision for the entire bill, then I, from memory, I think that would cover about two years. Um, I think what the, the, the difference to the budget is in respect of a reassessment of the, the total bill in, in the round as opposed to any expectation of flow of funds that will happen in in right. future years in, in close proximity. Could, could you give us a fuller explanation of that, please, as Delighted part of the follow-up, so we understand it? Of course. Because this is important, and you know, we're more and more going like America in terms of people suing the health service, so it's one of those areas to keep a close eye on, I think, in, in the future. The second question... To um, get a clarification. In the accounts, uh, I think there's another 300 million of contingent liabilities in respect of the um, clinical and medical compensation payments. So in addition to what's provided, there's potential of even more coming in. So could you maybe build that into your yes. explanation it'd, it'd as well? It would be useful to have a briefing that brings all this together, including actual payouts, you know, over, the, say, the last three years. Committee on how the system works. Um, if you want to drill into the actual payouts beyond the numbers, that's obviously uh, something to take forward with the government. Yes. The numbers to see the flow of the numbers and how long the provision will last sure. for, and so on, and and wh why, you know, the 300 million vis-a-vis -vis the 160 million. What's the purpose of the two provisions? So, well? accountant's trickery for you, but yes. we'll explain how it works. <laughs> <laughs> with a capital T. With a very small T. <laughs> My second question. Uh, is the there, there are quite a number of portfolios where government gives guarantees. For example, in housing, uh, there are <coughs> income revenue guarantees. In uh, the economy, there are guarantees given to businesses rather than loans or grants or investment. There's also guarantees. So <coughs> how are guarantees dealt with in the accounts? Very good question. We're all turning to the relevant paragraph um, in the account in the report, sorry, which is uh, paragraph 33 on page 14. And I'll ask Stephen to talk you through how it works. Thank you, Auditor General. The, what we've uh, what we've looked to capture in the report about about guarantees, and and we placed it in the context of um, the specifically about the the hydro plant um, in, in Loch Arbor and the the guarantee that the government. Uh, entered into uh, f uh, for that for the purchase of um, electricity, uh, uh, if I recall, what the account what the accounts look to uh, to show is the government's potential liability should the um, there be a, a, a material change of circumstances um, in the provision, and then they then needed uh, to step in. So for that particular example, they've shown it as a twenty one point um, four million pounds. And, and similarly, I guess, to the, the, the previous discussion about, um, about claims as to the proximity of that, you know, will really depend as to you know, what happens about the viability of, of the provider, any change in, in price. But they've looked to, to show in the accounts that you know, this is a potential liability that could um, crystallise into the future. And because of the, they are able to, unlike some other liabilities, they are able to quantify that again, which is a, a particular test on accounting standards. And those liabilities and the provision of those liabilities in any way <coughs> affect the ability to spend money within the budget? No, they're not. It doesn't impact on the revenue or capital not, budget? They're not directly connected, but it is correct that the accounts adequately capture potential yeah, liabilities. Yeah. No, I understand time. that, but uh, it's the impact it has. So, for example, in terms of the uh, guarantees given to... Um, housing developers um, under the uh, housing guarantee scheme and uh, you know there could be a multitude of housing developers um, is, is there an upper limit is there a formula for deciding the upper limit to which the totality of guarantees can go um, I, I, I think the answer to that would be no there's a, a, a ultimately will depend on really the risk appetite that, that the government uh, has yeah um, um, around to as they consider schemes in the round I think our interest in that, that that's fully disclosed uh, right. in, in the annual accounts. So the issue is really disclosure, but it doesn't really impact on the, the actual 
budgets themselves per se. Correct. Right. Good. But as you're suggesting, it's very important that they are transparent and that Parliament sees how they're building up over time. Um, they're, they're disclosed in the notes to the accounts um, on pages 108 and 109. It's something we look at closely and we test, first of all, that they're being treated properly in accounting terms, that they shouldn't be contingent liabilities or provisions. Um, and secondly, keep an eye on how they're changing as they accumulate over time. Yeah. Obviously, it's key. That's right. right. Good. Okay, that's very helpful. My final issue is um, PFI and NPDs. Uh, now, obviously, we've touched on the Aberdeen Western Peripheral, and that was affected by reclassification, but my issue is a bit different from that. I think there are two issues. One is transparency of PFI deals in particular, but also NPDs to some extent. And secondly, the value for money issues around both. Um, I think there is a general acceptance that NPDs are better value for money than PFIs, but the question is, are they as good value for money as they could and should be? So um, the value for money issue presumably would be the subject of a very specific piece of work by yourself, Auditor General, and wouldn't be relevant to the consolidated accounts. So I'm going to pursue the transparency issue. Uh, I mean, if you take the famous Herr Meyer's PFI deal, um, which is now more than halfway through the contract period. When I was the health secretary, I asked for a copy of the contract. And the civil service said, do you really want a copy of the contract? And I said, I really want a copy of the contract. I want to read this contract. And they supplied the contract to me, and it stacked up way above this desk. It was huge, very complicated, and all the rest of it. But one thing became clear to me as the health secretary was nobody was really monitoring these PFI contracts. Uh, they were not being policed. And quite frankly, the contractors were getting away with financial murder, in my view. Um, are you satisfied, particularly in relation to PFI contracts, that there is, are, you, are you satisfied about the level of policing by the relevant bodies, such as health boards? Um. The first thing to say is that I agree with you entirely about transparency, um, that the uh, PFI NPD arrangements to which the Scottish Government is party are again included in the notes to the accounts and you can see some information there. Um, there is separate information in the quarterly report that this comes to the committee about capital projects, which shows how far from the 5% um, headroom limit that the Cabinet Secretary for Finance has set uh, the revenue commitments have got. But actually, it's very hard to see that picture overall and to see how the costs compare with each other. Um, the monitoring of almost all of the um, PPP, to use an umbrella term, public-private partnership schemes is subject, comes from the individual body, whether it's a health board, a local authority, um, an FE college uh, that, that holds the contract. Um, and I think they are, as you say, very complex um, contracts. Um, the ones I've seen recently tend to come on a DVD rather than on stacks of paper just because of the size of them. Um, and it, it's really important that the monitoring is focused on the right issues and receives the right degree of attention, given not just the, the financial commitments involved, but also the impact on um, the services provided to people and often critical services in education and health, for example. Um, it's not something that we look at directly unless a problem appears through our audit work. We are, though, planning another piece of work on public-private partnerships more generally, um, which is getting underway at the moment to report late next year, which is looking at the state of play on all of this. We produced a piece of work about a decade ago, or Audit Scotland did, which I think still stands up in many ways. What we haven't done is to refresh that for the current set of projects which are around to look at value for money and to look at the governance and the other arrangements around them which need to be in place to make sure that the, the public purse is um, receiving what it's paying for from them. I mean, certainly through Scottish Futures Trust, we brought a team into, I think it was Forth Valley, the hospital, uh, the Larbert Hospital, and they quickly identified breaches of the contract which have resulted in savings. But we're not doing it on anything like the scale that's, ha that's happening in many health boards south of the border, where very, very multi million pound recurring savings uh, are taking place because teams who have been brought in to look at 
this monitoring are identifying major breaches of contract, which of course opens up the whole contract and gives the public sector the ability to renegotiate many of the terms and conditions. So my question to you is, I understand that, for example, here Myers is the responsibility of Lanarkshire Health Board, um, but is it, should we not be taking a much more robust approach to ensure that the Lanarkshire Health Boards of this world are actually being as robust as they need to be to try and get a better deal and to make sure these contracts are being properly adhered to? Um, I think the Scottish Futures Trust has made a big contribution by bringing that expertise and ability to, first of all, negotiate better contracts and then understand the workings of the ones that are in place. I don't know what they've done in terms of review reviewing other um, contracts that are currently underway, like the fourth value one, and it's something else that they take away and have a look at. Very good question. I mean, it's also something for the Accounts Commission because a lot of the contracts were in relation to schools, and they're some of the worst contracts as well, in my view, and certainly the evidence is. And the problem is because of the commercial confidentiality, when you try to get to the information and the terms and conditions of these contracts, uh, organisations such as health boards and such as local authorities hide behind the commercial confidentiality rule. My view is that these things should all be open. You know, I, what I can see during a negotiation that you have to maintain degree of a degree of commercial confidentiality, but I think the public are entitled to know where their money is going once the deal's done strong advocate of transparency, I agree with you on that, and I yes. think the specific point of um, how how well the contracts are being reviewed in terms of their implementation once they're up and running is a very good one that I'll take away. Yes, I, I think there's potentially you know, significant savings in a number of portfolios um, if a more robust approach is taken throughout the public sector to PFI, and to a lesser extent, but nevertheless also we should be looking at NPD projects as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Uh, European structural funds. Uh, so, paragraph 65 to 67 of your report. Uh, you'll forgive me if I just try and translate this into language I understand, because it, it, I find it rather complex. See, uh, pick me up if I translate this wrong. Uh, as I understand it, there were suspensions on the ability of the funds related to the 2006 to 13 schemes on the ability of the Scottish Government to draw down on those funds uh, and as a result the Scottish Government went ahead and with some projects in the anticipation of receiving some funding. Uh, the Scottish Government makes provision of 14 million uh, in case those funds are not forthcoming and it turns out they're not forthcoming. Uh, however, what your report seems to say is that that 14 million provision was significantly short and that in fact the liability, the money that needs to be paid back to the structural funds is 31 million. Uh, and then you talk about the net cost being 21 million. Uh, what's going on there, please? <laughs> It's not just you, it is very complicated. What you just described, I think, is a very um, close uh, to what we're trying to say in the report, and I will hand over with gratitude to Michael to help you with the detail of it. I'll do my best to try and um, simplify a complex matter. I think what I'll do is, is co complicate it a little more to begin with um, by talking in euros, um, because that's obviously the payments that are, are made by the... Uh, European uh, Commission uh, uh, in that currency. I think given it's a closure of the programme, I think it's useful to talk about the programme as a whole, covering the, the, the 2007 to 2013 um, programme. So of that, in that period, 820 million euros was available to the Scottish Government. Um, around 90% was declared eligible expenditure, so that's 744 million euros. Um, the total actually received by the Scottish Government was, was more than that, 781 million euros. So that leaves a difference between the grants declared and the total received of 37 million euros, which translates to the 31 million sterling that, you, that, that, that is effectively a liability in the money that goes back to the European Commission. I understand. So the Scottish Government has to find 
31 million pounds at some point to give back to the European Commission. So that, that, that's that been through the accounts in 16-17. Yeah. Um, so that money has, in effect, been returned. It's subject to final checks by the European Commission. Um, so that the, as far as the Scottish Government is concerned, the Scottish Government will submit an audited report that's reporting the £31 million liability, but the Euro European Commission will do their own checks and are due to report, I think, by March next year. Um, so that final position may change, but as far as the as far as we know it just now, it's a £31 million liability. Right, and so that will be finalised March 2018. Uh, I believe we have a letter, the committee has a letter from April of 2017, in which I think the Scottish Government uh, is, is of the view that the amount owed is 13.3 million. Uh, so is it just simply the case that these figures that you're talking about in this report uh, have come out after that letter and therefore, it does the, if that's right, does the Scottish Government accept that we're potentially in the hole for £31 million? So I think there is a timing difference between the, the letter the committee received um, and I think the letter probably refers more to the £14 million provision that was created last year. But what we've found through this year's audit is that is now crystallised into a liability that was, was higher and more, more significant at €31 million. Euros, eh, sorry, £31 million. It's a big difference in what was provisioned for and what's actually liable for. Uh, is that an easy mistake to make? or it's, It probably comes through the, the final declaration. There's a lot more activity goes on to reconcile the amounts that have come from the Commission from projects that have either had self-corrections applied or indeed spending that was uh, withdrawn um, from um, internal checks that perhaps revealed that there was poor documentation or maybe some issue that means that they, they knew that the, the European Commission wouldn't approve that spending. So that so there was a lot more activity, particularly within the last quarter, which um, settled on that, that higher amount. The paragraph 67 of the report seems to me to, to come at it from the other end, if you like, that, that while this was going on, uh, various projects were happening uh, and some people, some companies were contracted, I guess. You've called them project sponsors, I think. But uh, I guess what you mean by that is people were engaged to deliver. Uh, as a result of that delivery, uh, you say the Scottish Government has overpaid uh, by £16 million. It, 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 Or you don't say overpaid, but the Scottish Government has paid out 16 million that it now seeks to take back from these people who were delivering the projects. Uh, or the, the Scottish Government is invoicing for, for that extra 16 million. What are the realistic prospects of getting any of that 16 million back on the basis that presumably the deliverers were engaged in good faith and delivered in good faith and invoiced in good faith? I think the um, the reason why um, it's 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 a difficult position. So, 16 million, uh, as you say, has has been overpaid to project sponsors. Um, in terms of the recovery of that, as I say, overpaid mean. So they've paid money to project sponsors that has not been eligible expenditure that is required to have gone back to the European Commission, but that has been settled between the Scottish Government and the European Commission in previous years. So this is money that is just due to come back to the Scottish Government. But it was presumably legitimate to be paid to the project sponsors. It, it wasn't their mistake, was it? They presumably contracted to deliver whatever it was they were supposed to deliver. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think uh, it was uh, basically money that was in hope that would be able to come from the European Commission through oh. eligible expenditure. So grants are paid by the Scottish Government in advance to project sponsors. Mm -hmm. and then once a year, the Scottish Government then make a, a declaration back to the European Commission to receive money for that. Yeah, but, I hope to give you a couple of examples of the sorts of things that lead to the errors that um, can potentially lead to repayment or...
to the funding not being available from the European Union. Um, the Scottish Government will accept applications from a range of bodies, which might be other public bodies, community associations, for um, projects or grants which are eligible within the terms of the scheme. Um, and they will approve some of that within the total funding that they've got available. As a condition of having that money, though, there are things which the project sponsors are required to do in terms of, for example, meeting procurement rules, um, having particular controls over the way the money is spent, and keeping an audit trail over that. And if it becomes clear later that those um, conditions have not been met, then, first of all, the funding isn't eligible to reclaim from Europe, which is part of the 31 million you've been talking about. And secondly, the bodies that have spent the money are not entitled to some or all of it from the Scottish Government. And that's the difficult judgment which government is having to take about reclaiming it from the bodies. Um, as you, as we mentioned briefly in this report and spent some time on last year, one of the things the Scottish Government did when projects went into interruption and suspension was to focus very much on improving the controls to make sure that much less of the spending um, would fall into that category where it wasn't eligible for European ESF funding. What we're seeing is the tail of, of um, money that went out before those changes had come in place. I understand. Uh, so the money's gone out to third sector organisations, perhaps. Uh, it's, it's a of different organisations, universities, colleges, mm -hmm. private sector, um, third sector, um, local authorities. It's a and combination. So the Scottish Government is now seeking for presumably perfectly legitimate reasons that the Auditor General set out, it could go to those bodies and say, can we have our significant funds back, please? And these are bodies which presumably have spent on the project, or may have spent on the project, uh, and no longer have those funds. Is that... <clears throat> so wouldn't it be... And if that's right, isn't it more likely that the Scottish Government needs to write off £16 million? Pounds? As Michael's mentioned, that there is a in terms of the invoices um, process is uh, is underway. Part of the correspondence that the government is is having with these bodies includes the provision for, for appeals to be um, factored into um, uh, any associated invoices. Um, we thought about that in terms of the disclosure that, that's captured uh, in the accounts as well, particularly whether or not the certainty around the, the ultimate receipt of that uh, of that sixteen million. And that's why it's not captured with certainty what we, as, a, as, a, as an asset or an anticipated flow of funds back to government just because of the nature of the appeals process that is, is, is detailed. Uh, final question from me then would be, there are, the, 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 as uh, Michael Oliphant talks about, the, there's a distinct programme 2006 to 13. There's another programme now running, 14 to 20. Is there any impact... Uh, on those projects as a result of the issues with the 2006 to 13? Because I think the Scottish Government says start, the start of some of those projects has been delayed. Uh, so has there been a significant impact? And if so, what is it? So in, in, in terms of the monetary impact, that's, that's quite separate. It's distinct to the 2007-13 programme. Um, what is of um, interest in, in how the, the new programme um, uh, is applied is a lot of it is around the management of the controls in place, which is where we've seen some of the problems arise from the previous programme. We understand that uh, the Scottish Government are still designing and improving controls around that, although the, the European uh, Commission has approved their overall controls framework for this programme. Um, and I think the, the letter that the, the committee received back in January out, outlined some of the principles that the Scottish Government hope to apply with that. Um, that's something that we'll be looking at with interest in our forthcoming um, annual audit um, covering the period 17-18. Thank you. Okay, Bill Berman. Well, thank you, convener. Can I just come then to, um, I think it's paragraph 59, and it's the CAP futures, and back to your um, £60 million. Um, can we just clarify then, what are they actually booked in relation to that? Thank you. Um, the £60 million you refer to was the, the figure that we captured in the, the June uh, report on the CAP futures follow-up, which we identified that there was a, a potential penalty um, um, in respect of um, common agricultural payments, 
the 60 million was based on our um, interpretation of potential fines arising from not just from uh, the timing of payments, but also factoring in the the assessment of the control environment that, that exists. Um, that assessment is then translated in part into the disclosures that are in the consolidated accounts. And again, re refers back to our earlier discussion about the certainty and the timing um, of, of some of those liabilities. The certainty element is captured in, in the provision of, of two and a half um, million pounds in respect of penalties. This year's accounts also include um, an unquantified contingent liability. And, in, and, and the reason for that is that we, we've sought to uh, explain in, in Exhibit 6 to the report about the, really the interaction that can take place between um, payment agencies through, um, and the Commission. Any indication of potential penalties that come from the Commission are always subject to negotiation and, and further timing. So our judgment um, on the basis of the disclosures was that it's a, a perhaps a bit like the, the the clinical negligence claims we talked about earlier, is that it's a mixture of both a provision and a contingent liability. You spoke about the 60 and they've actually booked two and a half. In. Is that the number? Book two and a half in 2016-17, a provision, and then the, the unquantified contingent liability for future. If they'd booked the 60, would you just have gone tick and move on? Uh, no, I don't think we would. Mm. I think it's... Uh, our audit work is always subject to, to discussion and, and reference to, uh, to auditing standards uh, and accounting standards. And you know, whilst it's, uh, we think both are right, to, to cut a long story short, the 60 million was based on a methodology in terms of the, um, the potential liabilities, but translating that into what's appropriate for capturing in the, um, the audited accounts, I think that's better reflected by way of an unquantified contingent liability. I mean, we seem to be reaching the position, convener, that we're reading the numbers and then we're having to go to the notes to read the words and then start to make a judgment as to whether, you know, as Alec Neil was looking at earlier, um, you know, we should perhaps read notes 15 to 17 and add the numbers up in our heads because I guess if you were an external analyst, you would just add the contingent liabilities in and say, you know, these are numbers that could go out the door. Um, I, I just think that perhaps we you know, we're talking about better disclosure, better, more transparency, and then you have to read into quite small print here about unquantified contingent liabilities. Now that's quite difficult even for somebody who is familiar with these sort of terms as to exactly what they mean. And I don't know if and you can perhaps remind me because you'll be more familiar with the accounts in the front part of the accounts where there's the, all the discussion about what the, you know the government's done do they go into the detail of what you know these things might mean there, there is reference to the to the cap futures um within the, the narrative but generally within contingent liabilities contingent assets indemnities guarantees <coughs> i know there's reference to the um ability of the government to give guarantees and the authorization limits and how uh, I don't know if you've looked at that at all in any of your your work but it looks like there's quite a lot of issues within here that you know, might take a bit more detailed reading than just um, you know for a for a lay person to to pick up um, be interested to see how the um, the health the NHS um, medical claims comes out because some quite big numbers within that and you know, do you get the impression that things are just being put into contingent liabilities and we'll sort of feed them back in the future as we have to, as opposed to being you know, very careful and prudent and making full provision for what you know, should be made now? I think, as Stephen said, we, we test those questions very carefully, as any auditor would, to make sure the accounting treatment is correct. Um, and then um, my reporting, both the annual audit report that um, is produced and published and the Section 22 report to this one, aims to bring that picture together. We are also seeing improvements in the Scottish Government's reporting. The narratives improved over time. The disclosures are now fuller than they have been, and we continue to encourage them to push them to include disclosures where we think they ought to be there. Um, but I think 
Um, it's also true that the importance of those figures is becoming increasingly important as we are now a tax raising as well as a spending parliament. It does feel to me this is uh, a sort of milestone year with the introduction of income tax powers on all non-savings, non-dividend income and the greater level of volatility that brings. That's why both my recommendations and those of the Budget Process Review Group are about getting more of that transparency in, in future to the financial statements but also to the budget so people can see the relation between the two. I think we'll take the health um, review of the provisions there as a, a good test case and see how we get on with, with okay. that. Can I just add a point in the yeah. detail you mentioned about um, mm. the, the need to go through the notes and sort of add up the numbers. Paragraph 33 of our report, um, we just outline what, where the liabilities can be quantified um, and that's an estimated 429 million. So that's the ones that, that are quantifiable at this stage. The, this report, you mean the one to us? Yes. 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 Okay, I take that as a useful number, but I suppose within the, the financial statements themselves, there, I don't think there's a summary like no. that that I recall. So, is there any other inform is, or is there any information in your report that's not available from the accounts, or is it all drawn from the accounts? I think it's all drawn from the accounts and our insights into them from the wider audit work that we do. Um, the aim is to pull out the things that are of, of interest and we hope useful to this committee and to Parliament more well, widely. There's no disclosure that's new. There, there are, we do pull some information for some of the exhibits, particularly if we're reconciling the Scottish budget to HM Treasury's budget, and that comes from a budget documents, for example, and uh, one or two other disclosures that come from the audited accounts of other bodies. Okay. Good day. Thank you very much for your evidence this morning and now move the committee into private session.